Welcome back to What You're Reading Wednesdays. Thanks for tuning in and spending time with us. Have you ever thought about how stories change to reflect our changing culture? Well, today we're talking about emerging genres from the last 20 years. Let's dig a little deeper, shall we? Mary! What are some emerging genres you've noticed in the last 20 years? Well, some of these, I don't know that they're really emerging genres or they're just genres that are re-emerging. There is more steampunk than there used to be, especially in the young adult sections. Definitely some LGBTQ books. Um, even horror is becoming more popular than it was at least 20 years prior. And, and definitely some urban fiction and street fiction. I'll second the LGBT uh, comment. See last week's discussion. Graphic novels is a big one. Um, a lot of my thesis work deals with comic books and uh, newspaper comics. So it's fun to see that kind of extolled as a positive thing as opposed to um, the negative connotations that it held for a long time. I would have to agree with Mary. Um, the ones that she mentioned are truly, I think, are emerging or, you know, a new twist or re-emerging kind of situation. I know me personally, um, as far as urban literature, I would also have to say, we didn't have this on list, but some erotica, I think, is kind of a new emerging genre. Um, you know, taking, for instance, you know, the Fifty Shades of Grey, Zane books, um, you know, those kinds of books. I kind of just based it on, like, what I know that I've read that's considered emerging. Um, and so like graphic novels I've recently gotten into, um, I didn't realize that those weren't huge because as far as I know, I've always kind of had them around. They just weren't ever my favorite. Um, obviously also the LGBTQ plus genre, um, I read all the time. Again, that wasn't really like emerging for me. It was just like a thing to read that I enjoyed. Um, another one that I guess is emerging, but I've been reading it since I was in like eighth grade. We're not going to talk about how long ago that was. Um, but fan fiction <laughs> is technically emerging. Um, and a lot of books that you see getting published these days um, were once published for free online as fan fiction. They just had to change some names uh, to get published. Um, they're not all winners, I'll tell you that. But mm -hmm. they're not getting published. And then another genre that is considered emerging that is probably the worst name for a genre I can think of is chiclet, women's fiction. Um, if we can just all agree that women's fiction is the worst um, name for a genre, then um, we'll be good. <laughs> it seems like the books I gravitate towards are queer fiction, um, also, also urban fantasy, which I interestingly looked up um, on our list, it's called Magical Realism. Um, and I looked to see if there's any difference between the two terms. And most people say it's the same, um, but Wikipedia classifies Magical Realism as um, these supernatural elements taking place worldwide. Um, and urban fantasy just takes place in a city mm. setting. So I know people have been talking about comics and manga, but um, definitely more prevalent in recent years, at least the last two decades. Um, and I've said this before on here, but comics and graphic novels and manga are technically like mediums rather than genres. Mm -hmm. And they contain, you know, genres within themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, what I like about them is you, I think nearly anyone can pick up a comic or a graphic novel or a manga that they would enjoy because there's so many different genres within them. Like one thing I particularly like about like manga is um, I'll read those genres that I normally don't in regular. Um, an example of that is I'm not like, I don't really care about um, contemporary fiction generally, but one of my favorite genres in manga is slice of life, which is just that like a realistic. What I like about those graphic novels is sometimes I will pick a like a classic book, which they've redone as a graphic novel, because I'm not sure I'm going to get through the other one, mm -hmm. like Margaret Atwood's, you know, mm -hmm. The Handmaid's Tale. I, I know we have a graphic novel adaptation. I have not checked it out yet, but, you know, really I, I probably can get through that, but the book, I don't know if I can. Oh, so they literally came out with a graphic novel adaption of the 9-11 report. So, I mean, it hmm. gets you to read. 
And I think it, I think the graphic novels make it more accessible. I really do. Yeah. I think that some of the genres are coming out. They're making reading and the love of reading more accessible to different types of people. And even if you have even different learning disabilities with ADHD, ADAD, those kinds of things. Do you guys know the Red Rising books? You read those? Yes. My yeah, husband, Pierce Brown. Brown. Yeah, right, Pierce Brown. My husband's into those, and I wouldn't really dream of picking up the 800-page book, but he's got the graphic novel, and I would consider looking at that first. So yeah, mm. I think that's very true. It's less daunting. I've always said that I want to read the Game of Thrones series um, just to make myself feel better about the TV show. Um, but those books are terrifying. And I think since I know that there's a graphic novel option, I would probably gravitate more towards that than an actual novel. I know when we went through the 2019 top books, I realized about myself that I'm very mainstream in my picks. So um, I didn't have a great one from the list, but I did think about just the people that I follow on Instagram, like a lot of the nonfiction books that I that I read, often it's people who are influencers, they've created this platform, and then they've created a book as a result of that. So I feel like that's kind of a new thing in the last 10 years. I think about like the Ann Landers and the Deer whatever, um, <laughs> some of the original lifestyle influencers who wrote for newspapers who are writing those sorts of books. Well, Dave Barry, isn't he still writing some books? Yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or like those books, they don't come out so much anymore. That's maybe a dying genre, but like they would just take somebody's blog posts and like put them all in a book. Like, isn't that the book like Shit My Dad Says? Wasn't that what that was? There's a collection of tweets um, from Lynn manuel Miranda. I think it's called Good Morning Sun. That's exactly like that, where it's just a collection of his tweets. Do you remember the book where people sent posts? Oh, Secret! Yes! Yes! What is it called? Post Secret. Post Secret. Oh. Yeah. Where they sent like postcards with their anonymous postcards with like their deepest, darkest secrets on them. Oh. You know, when I was ordering books a while back, and I can't remember what even age group we were looking for, but it probably was adult. It was, it was something that would be like, choose your own adventure. Mm. But it was like, it was just, they had like multiple endings for the mm -hmm. book. Um, and it was not that terribly long ago, I thought, but I can't, I, I should have looked this up ahead of time. I forgot about it, but that's something that, I mean, was very, very popular in the middle grade, mm -hmm. you know, age, but something that's trying to come back maybe. Well, first of all, my brothers and I would stock up on those books in the children's department <laughs> years ago. There was a Netflix series and I don't know what the name is going to be right here. I, I think it was oh. like, Bandersnatch or Bender yeah. Cumberbatch or <laughs> that's exactly what it was I think where it was kind of like a choose your own adventure Netflix series that I yep. didn't yeah. do but good lord I loved those books it reminds me and Justine can probably chime in on this but the advent of visual novels um either through video game medium or mm -hmm. like a, yep. your phone nowadays where you like listen to the story and then you can like choose what your responses or what your character is going to say and then it'll give you different endings or different routes mm. that you can do. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Ace Attorney games are the oh, ones I that come Ace to mind. Attorney yeah, oh, so good. Are these genres truly new or are they an evolution of the same stories we've always told? I think some of them um, are truly new but um, I think a lot are just renamed like Cli-Fi for example. Um, you know, science fiction dealing with climate change, I think, has been around for a long time. Um, you know, definitely in H.G. Wells's writing. Um, so I think it might just be renamed um, to get more people interested in it um, who hadn't thought of it before. Some of it, I think, where it comes in is where we get, get where the writer has like combined two genres together, kind of, which which they do in some cases. Um, I was looking and I was seeing things that were considered urban fiction, but then there was something else called urban Latino fiction. And I thought, okay, that's a little bit different, you know? 
I think for the most part, most are the same. Um, authors are venturing into other um, genres due to what circumstance, I don't know. I was listening to a, uh, an event just the other day with some female authors and most of them started out writing romance, but it got to a point where it was so oversaturated that they ventured into writing other things because what they wanted to write, there was too many already, so they ventured into something else. So I think that's sometimes where it comes in where we get that paranormal romance that was popular for a while and some of those other, other types. You know, I mentioned like online influencers and, and more of those nonfiction, real life stories thinking back when i was a teenager i used to read a lot of chicken soup for the soul kind of real life stories and confessions and you know i feel like society has changed we have these new tools so i would say for urban lit i definitely think it's definitely emerging um i don't know if it's a new twist on an old thing now it's really about um things that are happening in the african-american communities i would say like the essence bestsellers list has come out of that um, and so, you know, not like New York Times, not like, you know, the LA Times where they have these book lists, but this specific book list that comes out for African American authors and rates them, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's an honor to be like, you know, Essence bestseller on the Essence bestseller list. So I think that's also been something that's also evolved too, is how people access books and things like that. And, you know, making them more, again, more accessible. A lot of them don't hit mainstream. There's a couple mainstream authors, um, like Eric Jerome Dickey's mainstream, um, Omar Tyree is mainstream. These are some people that like just made it big. Zane is mainstream. And what's also interesting too is they've actually, you know, Zane is one of those people that she's now it's like Zane presents. And so she introduced new authors that way. Um, so she's kind of curated and you know, found talent. Um, in the black community to, you know, promote and things like that as well. So I definitely think that, you know, urban fiction is, is a movement at this particular point, um, for sure. So like, when I think of this question, um, what came to my mind was like retellings, like modern retellings of like stories and things that have already existed and just like putting a twist on them, um, whether it's, you know, like putting in queer characters instead of, you know, a straight couple in a romance um or like even telling it from the villain's perspective instead of you know the prince or princess like the twisted tales that we're seeing come out or even just like not even just the villain but like just a different side character um giving them the spotlight and um uh, i want to second what was said about cli-fi although i really don't like that i don't like how it tastes in my mouth i don't either um, but there's a there's actually another genre of like environmental fiction called solar punk that's come out in like the last uh, years, um, and it's largely been pushed by uh, black and Asian authors. Ooh. Actually, it's kind of a, uh, a it's a twist on like cli-fi, but in a in an overtly positive way. You know, there's self sufficient gardening and the environment is healing itself, and it's it's actually kind of a balm to the soul. So I, I want to point to like Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower for the beginning of that, but it's, I mean, it's really come up in like the last 10 years with like the internet and easier publishing access. Yeah. And fan fiction, let's talk about it. So I think <laughs> the, other, the other day, um, Audrey mentioned that like uh, Star Trek, like Kirk Spock fan fiction was some of the, the early stuff. Earliest, but yeah let's take a moment to consider Bible fan fiction, because that is what Dante's Inferno is. That is what Paradise Lost is. That's what Faustus is. I mean, all of these. Well, if we just think like Connecticut Yankee King Arthur's Court is like King Arthur fan fiction. I mean, it's been around. It's been around the block. I know there's the Fifty Shades of Grey series, but isn't there another, what's like the Shadowhunters, I think is one. Yep. Um, um, Cassandra Clare. Cassandra Clare, yeah. Cassandra yeah. Clare is an infamous example. And some, some of the times the writing is bad, but the story concept is really, really good. I know a lot of people said that even about, you know, kind of discriminatory in some ways about, you know, urban lit. 
They said it was poorly written. Obviously, they used a lot of cuss words. There was a lot of profanity. There's a lot of, you know, sexual innuendos, but just it was too much, maybe too much vernacular, too much, you know what I mean? Um, col colloquialism, I can't even say it now, but you guys know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? I'll tell you some big words for y'all. Um, but yeah, like there's just so many of those things that, you know, but it spoke to a whole generation of people. It, you know yes. what I mean? So you have yep. to decide like what's really important, you know? Um, is it important that someone reads or is it, some, is it important that someone reads something that's, that's going to last a long time? Like, you know what I mean? So, I mean, or is it just, you know, we just have it for fun. Even if it's poorly written, if it's a great story. I know one of the people I, you know, you, and you recommend books. I'm like, oh, like True the Game by Terry Woods. Like it was poorly written, but it was a great story. They even made it into the movie. The movie wasn't that great because um, the book was way better because it was a series. But yeah, but stuff like that. But it was like, oh, people were like, well, it was poorly written. I said, but again, it inspired people to read in the first place that might not have wanted to read. Does culture shape literature or does literature shape culture? I would say it's a little bit of both. Culture shapes the stories and the narratives that we tell. Um, and I probably lean a little bit more that way. Like we write about life as we're experiencing it. I think it's, it's kind of both. When we were discussing if it's chicken or the egg, I think it's just a little bit of both. Um, I would agree that I would lean more towards culture shaping literature. Um, although, you know, the more that people read books um, outside of their comfort zones and about people that they're not familiar with, it gives them a better understanding of culture. But um, I would definitely lean more towards culture shaping our narratives that we write. Well, literature doesn't exist in a vacuum, so it's got to come from somewhere. And um, I think one of the great things about stories is that they do reflect our culture. And in some cases, I think they can help manifest like a, a better future. But for the most part, I think there's a reason why we're able to look at books that were published, you know, 100, 200 years ago and use them to identify themes and, um, you know, structures that, you know, maybe the author didn't even intend to include, but they did anyway, because literature reacts to history. And I also think that literature has a way of shaping individual culture, like what you read growing up kind of shapes you as like a young adult and an adult just because you kind of come into what you're interested in and what you end up reading for maybe the rest of your life. So it's not like a huge cultural impact that way, but it's just a very like individual sort of thing. It's a little bit of both, but I definitely feel like culture definitely affects the literature and because you write about what what you know and if you especially if you're living it you write about what you know i know most authors take that approach for what they've even been through you know and draw inspiration from that uh, i totally agree with that but this is where i can see where if you're reading across different genres reading um, books by people from other countries other cultures where you can really change the way you feel about things so reading is the answer. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can learn so much and just that little spark in your head that says, well, wait a minute. Remember when you read that? Uh -huh. it, it could change your way of thinking. Well, and I'm just thinking about all the, all the, um, the anti-racism books that people mm -hmm. should be reading. I mean, how much it's going to change the way we think about things, the way we do things. Hopefully. Well, they've been dominating the New York Times bestseller nonfiction. Top 10. I mean, any kind of book, even if it's a fictional book, it still makes you think differently than you thought before, because it Hopefully. may be something you didn't know. Angie, what's your opinion? Well, <laughs> should I do that again? Justine, what do you think? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get two passes. You only get one pass.